first? Yeah. We good? Okay. My name is Rachel Silva and I work for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Thank you all for coming and welcome to the Sandwiching and History Tour of the Clifton House. Before we get started, I want to thank the owners, Tim and Vanessa McEwen, for allowing us to tour their beautiful home today. Tim and Vanessa, you can go around the car. And also, Vanessa's friend Molly, and anybody else who helped to get the house ready. I know Molly's made cookies for y'all inside. It smells great. <laughs> for any architects in the audience, this tour is worth one hour of HSW continuing education credit through the American Institute of Architects. If you're interested in that, please see me after the tour. The Thomas M. Clifton House was built about 1901 and exhibits elements of the colonial revival and craftsman styles of architecture. It is a contributing resource in the Central High School Neighborhood Historic District, which was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1996. I'm gonna tell you about the background of the Central High Neighborhood in this edition, the Centennial Edition, which is what we're in today, and then I'll tell you all about the history of the Clifton House itself. Little Rock Central High School neighborhood, originally called the West End, is largely defined, as you all know, by a momentous event that occurred 80 years after this area was originally platted for development. The Centennial Edition, named in honor of our country's centennial celebration, and the largest edition in the neighborhood, was platted back in 1877. Historically, the Central High neighborhood was called the West End because it was literally at the western edge of the city. Only a few scattered homes existed here in the West End until the mid to late 1890s when more construction began. However, Little Rock residents were enticed to visit this area beginning on May 16, 1885 when the Little Rock Street Railway Company opened West End Park at the end of its 9th Street line. The 9th Street line was one of four lines in the streetcar system at that time. It began at 15th and Chester. It ran west on 15th to High, or what's now Martin Luther King. It turned north on High to 14th, which is now Daisy Bates, where it turned west on 14th and ran for about six blocks, a little branch line, where it ended at West End Park, which is the current side of Central High School, if you don't already know that. But the main line, the reason why it was called the 9th Street line, the main line continued north on high all the way to 9th, where it turned to the east and went back toward downtown, thus the 9th Street line name. Interestingly, and probably not surprisingly, several of the various streetcar company's officers, men like H.G. Alice, H.P. Bradford, Howard Adams, W.B. Worthen, John B. Jones, they also were involved in residential development of the West End later on. West End Park provided a much needed recreational space for city residents, but it also served as a way to entice people out to ride the streetcar line out to the end of the line and look around where there would be lots available for sale pretty soon. West End Park itself covered six blocks from 14th or Daisy Bates down to 16th and from Park over to Jones on the west. It was a densely wooded park and it boasted a large pavilion for dancing, refreshment stands, a bicycle track, roller coaster, and even a lake for boating. Admission to the park was usually 25 cents for adults and 15 cents for children. From all accounts in the Arkansas Gazette, West End Park was a hit from the very beginning. The park was especially popular on Sunday afternoon when music was provided by the Little Rock Band. And during the heat of the summer, the streetcar company promised to keep the park open late for, quote, the accommodation of those who wish to pass the hot nights out in the suburbs. 
The first amateur baseball games were played at West End Park in 1893. In 1894, a baseball field and grandstand were built on the west side of the park. And this became the home field for the Little Rock Baseball Association, and later the city's first minor league baseball team, the Little Rock Travelers. West End Park's field was also used for major league spring training camps. The grandstand was rebuilt in 1915 and named after Judge William Marmaduke Cavanaugh, who died in February of 1915. Cavanaugh had been president of the Southern League since 1903 and was a strong supporter of the Little Rock Travelers. Cavanaugh Field was home to the Travelers until 1932 when Ray Winder Field opened. And Quigley Stadium, built in 1936 by the WPA, now occupies that site of Cavanaugh Field. So after the streetcar company opened Forest Park in Pulaski Heights in 1904, they no longer wanted to maintain West End Park over here. So, hey Charles, what's up? At Lamar Porter? Yeah. I don't know if they did. Did anybody hear, hear that? Oh. Early on, they played out here, though. Okay. Yep. So maybe they went to Lamar, whether it's Bill and Ray Winter. Maybe so. I don't know. Uh, find out. Let me know. You find out. <laughs> so after the streetcar company opened Forest Park, they didn't want to maintain West End Park here. So they sold it to the city of Little Rock. The sale was negotiated in 1907 for $30,000, which the city finally paid the streetcar company in 1913. <laughs> However, the park grounds outside the stadium, outside Cavanaugh Field, were rarely used after 1912. So they weren't maintained anymore on the east side of the property. In 1922, a portion of the park grounds was reestablished as Civitan Park and maintained by the Little Rock Civitan Club. But that only lasted a few years because in 1927, the Little Rock Senior High School was built on that site, on the eastern side of the former West End Park property, now Little Rock Central High School. And Park Street, so named because it was the park's eastern boundary, serves as a reminder of the area's past. Real estate developers began advertising residential lots for sale in the 1890s, and most homes in the neighborhood were built between 1900 and 1930. Although the streetcar line had slightly changed its route by 1913, it still offered excellent service to the West End. According to the Arkansas Gazette, Little Rock Street, Street Railway and Electric Company's 15th Street line, quote, traversed the southwest portion of the city passing through the most fashionable residential district. That's here. <laughs> the West End was a solid middle-class neighborhood. The cost of homes in the early 20th century ranged from 2,000 or less for a modest wood frame residence to between $5,000 and $7,000 for a two-story house on Summit, Marshall, Wolf, or Battery. These property values remained pretty stable until at least the mid-20th century. A 1940 real estate survey indicated that property values here in the West End were pretty similar to those in Pulaski Heights. With the exception of the highest bracket, homes worth $20,000 and up, those were only found in the exclusive residential additions of the Heights like Prospect Terrace and Edge Hill, not here in the West End. Now about the Clifton House and this block, the 1400 block. From at least the mid-1880s until about 1900, Summit Street was called West Spring Street. According to the 1897-98 Little Rock City Directory, West Spring Street Summit was completely undeveloped between 14th, Daisy Bates, and 17th, a couple blocks to our south. With the exception of the houses at 1410 and 1414, these two right here with the rock and the white one right next to it, besides those two, all the other homes in this block, the 1400 block, were built between about 1899 and 1905. With the oldest house on the block being right behind you at 1422, built about 1899, and that's the Martin A. Sharp house. Built about 1901, the Clifton House, 
I told you already, but I'll tell you more, exhibits elements of the two most common styles of architecture in the Central High School neighborhood historic district, Colonial Revival and Craftsman. The Colonial Revival style was popular in Arkansas beginning in the late 19th century through the middle of the 20th century and sought to revive elements of American colonial architecture from the Eastern Seaboard. The most obvious Colonial Revival characteristic on the Clifton House is its front porch. The craftsman style of architecture emphasized human handiwork or craftsmanship rather than mass-produced elements. And the style was popular in Arkansas during the first half of the 20th century. Characteristics on the Clifton House include the exposed rafter tails and the triangular knee braces underneath the eave there on that front facing gable. The Clifton House is located on Block 19, Lot 6, in the centennial addition to the city of Little Rock, which I told you was platted 1877. Thomas M. Clifton and his family moved into the house shortly after its completion. Missouri native Thomas Monroe Clifton was born in 1855. He married Hulda May Shepard on October 6, 1888 at Carthage, Missouri. Thomas and Hulda May Clifton had two children, a son, Thomas Henry Clifton, he went by Henry, and he died in 1928 at the age of 37. And they also had a daughter, Rachel Maybell Clifton, who was born November 4th, 1904, but died just five days later. By the 1890s, the Cliftons lived on West 15th Street before they moved over here. They were in Bering Cross, West 15th Street and Bering Cross, which if you don't know, that's North Little Rock. But at that time, it was the eighth ward of Little Rock, where Thomas worked as a wheelwright and a carpenter. About 1901, the Cliftons moved here to 1423 South Summit, and Thomas got a job in the Choctaw, Oklahoma, and Gulf Railroad shops. And you might have thought, you might think, why would he move here if he got a job with the railroad? Why would that be convenient? Well, because he could walk about seven or eight blocks to the west and hop a train. They would go slow enough through here where he could hop on a train, <laughs> ride it around south, around the city, to the Roundhouse at 29th and Barber. That's where the Rock Island, that later became the Rock Island. That's where their Roundhouse was located, 29th and Barber. In 1903, prominent businessman Warren E. Lennon was elected mayor of Little Rock. And Lennon, who lived about a block southwest of us, at the southwest corner of 16th and Summit, recruited his neighbor, Thomas Clifton, who lived here, to serve as sergeant for the Little Rock Police Department. And Clifton rose through the ranks, and by 1907, he was a captain. When Mayor Lennon retired in 1908, right after the opening of the new Little Rock City Hall, to devote more time to his business interests, Clifton also retired from the police force. Interestingly, during the administration of another progressive mayor, Charles Taylor, Clifton returned and served again for six years as captain of the police department. <coughs> and Mayor Taylor ran for office on a platform to modernize city services, improve public health, and reduce crime. And during his administration, he was very, he had a big crackdown on all the saloons in Little Rock, on prostitution, and on gambling. And he was known to participate in these raids on gambling or any of those establishments himself. So I bet that Thomas Clifton was either a progressive, reform-minded individual as well, or he was just tough as nails and he said, I want you to come back and be captain and take care of all this stuff for me. After his second stint with the Little Rock Police Department, Clifton became a special agent for the Missouri Pacific Railroad. And railroad special agents were kind of like railroad police and they would be responsible for protecting the company's personnel, any passengers, cargo, their property, everything. In 1920, Clifton bought the house at 2915 South Summit, way south of Roosevelt, which was a one-story Colonial Revival style house built about 1910. And Thomas and Hilda Mae Clifton moved down the street to 2915 Summit. Their son, Thomas Henry Clifton, and his wife, Margaret, remained here in this house. But not long after his move down the street, Thomas Clifton died at a local hospital. Hang on. I'll wait till he goes through here. Oh, 
Okay. So not long after he moved down the street, Thomas Clifton died in a local hospital on June 8, 1921, at the age of 66. And according to his obituary, Clifton's body was removed to the home at 2915 Summit, where a funeral was held the following afternoon on June 10, 1921, with burial following at Oakland Fraternal Cemetery. Clifton was a member of Forest Camp, Woodman of the World, and of the Maple Grove Woodman Circle Number 2, both of those being fraternal organizations with life insurance benefits, although he doesn't have a Woodman of the World grave marker. And Clifton must have been either well-respected or well-known at the very least because his obituary in the Arkansas Gazette came with a big picture of him. And also in the Arkansas Democrat, his obituary made the front page of the paper. So you can look at this closer up if you want to at the end. All right, after the death of Thomas Clifton, the house at 1423 Summit was sold to John Cannon and his wife, Edna. Cannon worked as a mail contractor for the US government. He, Edna, and their daughter, Mildred, lived here in this house from 1923 until about 1936. And by 1937, Cannon was using this as a rental property, first leasing it to physician Cadmus Brooks and his wife, Jenny, followed by Orville and Addie Farquharson. The next long-term owners of the house were Henry and Lola Harris, and Henry worked as an accountant at the Veterans Administration and later as a postal clerk. And the Harrises occupied the house from 1949 until 1973. Beginning in the 1970s, though, after they got out of the house in 73, the Clifton house sometimes sat vacant for years at a time in between different owners. And not surprisingly, the house deteriorated. So fast forward to 2009, Tim and Vanessa McEwen bought the Clifton House in May 2009 and began the process of rehabilitating it. They did lots of the work themselves, uh, namely Tim basically rewired the entire house. The roof had to be completely replaced, but the exterior wood siding was in pretty good shape overall, and the house retained its original wood frame windows. In October 2013, Tim and Vanessa hired Donna Thomas Properties and Jay Carmen Inc. to finish up the rehabilitation. And it was done with the help of State Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credits. In April 2014, Tim and Vanessa moved into the Clifton House. Now some details that you'll notice whenever you go inside. At some point, a downstairs bathroom was built in the corner of the dining room. Well, that was, that was taken out, obviously. They removed that to restore the original dining room space, and Donna Thomas had the plate rail remilled to match the rest of the room as it goes around. You'll, you'll notice that. Both the current upstairs and downstairs bathrooms were entirely redone. That's all new stuff, except for um, two notable things in the upstairs bathroom. Uh, first, the, the new custom-made vanity that made by Donna and Jennifer. And then they, the upstairs bathroom has the old clothet tub from the Mandelbaum Pfeiffer house that most of you will, if you're sandwiching in history people, you'll know that we were supposed to tour the Mandelbaum Pfeiffer house at 908 Scott next month, but very sadly it burned in April. But that tub upstairs is from that house. The opening between the dining room and the kitchen was enlarged during the rehab to create a better flow between those spaces. And they took in the former butler's pantry, which had been converted into a laundry room, took that all into the kitchen to provide a larger kitchen. And at that time, whenever they got the house, it was a 1950s era kitchen. So it was pretty much gutted and redone. The house has new ceilings throughout, new light fixtures throughout, with the exception of two antique fixtures, which are not original to this home, but I believe the, the people that gave them to the McEwens think that they came from this, from houses in this neighborhood. And you'll see the two fixtures. They're in the two front rooms, and they were given to them by their friends Ed and Laura Sargent and Mark and Sherry Nichols. The house technically has three bedrooms and two bathrooms, but the third bedroom is the room they use for their TV room on the first floor. You'll see that one. The back sun porch, which you can spot easily if you walk around on the 15th Street side of the house, that was enclosed probably in the 1920s 
and you can tell that easily because it's got three over one windows back there and the rest of the house has one over one windows. And the garage, which you can't see from here, but if you walk around on the 15th Street side, you can see the garage back there, was probably built about 1930 and the garage part was on the first floor and there was living quarters on the second floor likely for domestic help. Now, I know some of you have already asked for Pulaski County back then. This house, at 1501. Everybody's been asking about this one. It was built about 1905 and it was built as a single family home. It's huge. Um, I mean, it was later had multiple people living in there as apartments, but it was built as a single family home and it was occupied by a variety of different people, including a William Hybock, who was a saloon owner of multiple saloons in Little Rock, Henry McCleskey, who was proprietor of the new Capitol Hotel and William F. Kirby, Associate Justice of the Arkansas Supreme Court. And it's currently being rehabilitated by a couple from BB, Arkansas, Daryl and Missy Orvis are rehabilitating that house with the help of a grant from the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. You can see our sign, the blue and white sign in the front yard, but they got an option one grant to do work on that house. And then also, if you go around the corner, I'm surprised you haven't asked me already, Charles, <laughs> the, the carriage house, the garage or carriage house right around the corner that has the steeple on it, everybody wants to know about that. That belongs to the house that's to the, just to the east of it, the white Colonial Revival at the corner of 15th and Battery. And that house is the Alfred J. Mercer house, built 1907. And Mercer was a cashier at the People's Bank. And that's, that's how it always looked. The steeple, it was just built as a carriage house. But it was used for domestic help upstairs and the garage downstairs. Does anybody have any questions before we go inside and look around? Well, uh, I'm curious about the changing of the street name. It used to be the Spring and now it's Summit. Is there a significant difference between the two names? Or is it Summit? I don't know. Because the way you said Clark was because it was Right. She, okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Hang on. She asked if there was any, she said about the street name changing from West Spring to Summit. And she asked if there was any significance to the summit name, and I said, I don't know. Because Park Street is so named because it was the boundary of West End Park, but I don't know why this is named Summit. Because this, when it was spring, it wouldn't have connected to like spring downtown. No, it was West Spring. It was completely separate. In the directories, this is listed as West Spring, and the Spring Street downtown is North and South Spring. It did not connect to it. That's why they changed it for that reason, because as this became less suburban and more part of right. Yeah. Well, that's, pr that's definitely a good reason for them to change it, but as far as where the name Summit comes from, I don't know. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I noticed they painted blue underneath the front porch. Is that to keep the bees and wasps from yeah. coming in like that Natchez? I don't know if that's what, did y'all did do that on purpose? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just painted it blue because that's what everybody paints the under of their porch. It's supposed to keep the haints away. <laughs> right. It's called haint blue. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Our next tour, if you have a brochure, I, I mentioned it earlier, the next tour is not what's on the brochure. That house burned. The next tour is December 4th at the Albert Pike Memorial Temple. Okay, you guys all know where that is, 712 Scott Street, downtown Little Rock. All right, now we can go inside.